You good? Sir. Well, good morning, Heights Community Church. We are so excited to, uh, to still, in the midst of all the stuff that's happening in our world, be able to gather uh, via an online space this morning and to lift our hearts and to worship together and to run to Jesus into his arms. This morning is a little different, uh, as you know, because you're all at home this morning, not just some of you on site, I mean online. Um, we, we decided as an elder team with all that was going on, uh, our staff kind of got bombarded within the lines of their homes. And so we just didn't have the, the resources to be able to execute a, a gathering this weekend. We hope that everybody's healthy and we're back in rhythm next Sunday on the 8th. But this morning, we're all here online. So everybody say hello. Let's just watch the comments blow up. Shay, we're kind of back to the old rhythm. You should have a bajillion comments, way more people to welcome than you can get to today. But we're excited that even in the midst of this culture, the pandemic taught us that we don't have to just throw everything out. We can still connect, still worship together, and still dive into God's word. And so we're excited. Invite some friends to join you. Hope maybe you have somebody in your living room uh, that doesn't normally worship with you on the weekend. And maybe this morning we could just enjoy our time together. I read a really cool uh, story this week about uh, they, they, they sort of surveyed 2,000 British people. And one of the things they discovered is this need for technology in our world has kind of made us impatient people, right? Because what happens is we have such access to technology and so quickly that the minute it doesn't come, we start to get frustrated. We start to get impatient. And so I was reading through the study and I realized, hey, I'm not sure the British people are all that impatient at all because what the research said of these 2,000 British people is they start to get frustrated at about the 22 second mark. And I started thinking to myself, man, I'm up trying to reboot the back of the TV at the five second mark. So these British people certainly can't be all that impatient or Ken must be really impatient or some combination thereof. I saw a really cool uh, story as well this week as we get ready to just lift our hearts and praise together. And it was about a gentleman who was walking along carrying a cup of coffee. And, a gen- and somebody bumped into his arm and he spilled the coffee everywhere. And somebody says to him, hey, why did you spill your coffee? And he says, hey, because somebody bumped into me. It wasn't my fault. And the gentleman says back to him, says, no, you didn't spill the coffee because somebody bumped into you. You spilled the coffee because that's what was inside the cup. See, had he had tea inside the cup, he'd have spilled tea. Had he had water inside the cup, he'd have spilled water. And the question for us is when we are cruising down through the story road of life, And somebody bumps into us. Life bumps into us. The road gets bumpy and we start to spill. What is it that's coming out? We've been in this series of the fruits of the spirit. And I wonder when we get bumped into and it starts to get rocky in the road. Is it love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control that starts to bump out? Or is it frustration and anger and rage and malice and slander And all those kinds of things. Because here's the deal. Life gives us the cup and you and I decide what goes inside. And so this morning as we prepare our hearts in a time of worship, I just want to ask you, would you start to say to God, God, show me what's inside and show me some spaces that you want to grow and you want to produce maybe a fruit, a product in the cup of life for Ken or for you that maybe I just need to be more aware of and more in tune with what you're doing. And we're going to worship and praise this morning. Um, You can clearly see behind me, we don't have an entire band of what that looks like. Uh, We're trying to just do the best we can do as an elder team and a leadership to to walk together, to steward this body, to love our fellowship together. Um, But we are going to lift our hearts in praise. So I want to just invite you where you are. Would you have um, someone in your room right now just pray in your house Uh, And then I'll pray in just a moment and we'll spend a time of worship and praise together. So go ahead and just pray in your home out loud. Something really cool happens when we pray out loud.
Father God, we come to you this morning praying for many in our fellowship and many in our city that are navigating a virus right now that's had various impacts on people. But Lord, we come to you asking for healing for many this morning. Would you be the great physician that you've promised you are? Would you teach us to lean into you and trust in you in these moments? Now would you be with us as we worship you in praise and we dive into your word this morning. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Would you stand up right there in your living room, in your bedroom, wherever it is. And maybe we need to be just reminded how good God is. Amidst all that you're navigating in your life, we serve an incredible God. Sing the splendor. The splendor of the King And in majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light and darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice trembles at his voice how great is our God sing with me how great is our God and all will sing how great how great is our God. Sing age to age and age to age he stands and time is in his hands beginning and the end beginning and the end the Godhead three in one Father, Spirit, Son Father, Spirit, Son the Lion and the Lamb Lion and the Lamb how great is our God would you sing with me how great is our God and all will sing how great how great is our God he's the name above all names you're the name above all names and worthy of all praise Sing how great is our God. One more time, you're the name above, because you're the name above all names. In worthy of all praise, and my heart will sing how great. Our God, how great is our God? Sing with me, how great is our God? All will sing, how great, how great is our God. sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art how great thou art 
cleansings my soul my Savior God to Thee how great Thou art how great Thou art would you have uh, just a moment in your living room and just Talk about those fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And just ask yourself, like, which one of those do I feel God produces the most? Which one is it that, that I see a reflection of the most? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, or self-control? Which one is that for you? Take a minute and a half that conversation as we continue in a time of worship. jealous for me loves like a hurricane I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy all of a sudden I am unaware of the eclipses eclipsed by glory and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. Sing it with me, he is jealous. He is jealous for me. Loves like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. All of a sudden, I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory. And I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. Oh, how he loves us so. Oh, how he loves us. How he loves us so. Redemption by the grace in his eyes. If grace is an ocean, we're all sinking. Heaven meets earth like an unforeseen kiss, and my heart turns violently inside of your chest. And I don't have the time to maintain these regrets when I think about.
how you love us how you love us oh oh how you love us how you love us oh one more time oh how you love us oh how you love us oh oh how you love us how you love us so father indeed we give you thanks for just the incredible deposit of your love in our life for those places that we can see those tangible expressions of it like we can we can almost reach out and touch them. We're, we're reminded of them. We give thanks for those places that <laughs> we just have to trust in faith. We have to lean into your word. We have to lean into your presence that you're there, that you're still loving us, even in those moments that it feels like a grind. And we trust you. We give you thanks. Thank you for loving me. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Whew. That's one of my favorite uh, songs to just kind of get lost to at the piano, to be honest with you, in my own personal quiet time and space and life and stage and, and all of those things. Um, this morning is indeed, as I, I mentioned earlier, it's a little different. Um, I haven't preached at a camera in quite some time without having people in front of me. And so it's, it's a little bit different. Um, I'm grateful for the reps that we've had at it and just the opportunity to still be able to connect together. I just want to thank um, so many people that just have, have poured out love this week. Um, Greg, I'll never forget it. He was pretty new to our church staff team a while back, and, he's, and he was probably here for maybe three, four weeks. And he said, Ken, I don't know what it is, but he says, You're, this church, Heights Community Church, does the one another's, the love one another, the care for one another better than any church I've ever seen in my life. And he was on staff at Second Baptist Church in Houston, Texas, which is a, a massive church as well. And so just thank you as a body for the way you've deposited and dropped off meals and mowed lawns and just done all the things to love so many who are grinding through this week. We do have a couple of meal plans together. We sent that out in an email. We put it out there on our social media pages for a couple of our families that have had people in the hospitals this week. Bruce got to go home uh, on Thursday night. We're hoping that maybe sometime this weekend, uh, good Lord willing, maybe tomorrow as you're seeing this, Drew Myers getting ready to leave the hospital and go home. But for those that were hospitalized, we got some meal calendars set up. If you'd like to drop a meal off Monday, Wednesday, or Friday, or just email them a, a, a food card, however you do that, Grubhub, or whatever those various ways that you can do that are, that would be fantastic as we just try to support them along the way as well. Uh, many of you have asked at this point in our house, um, our oldest daughter, Alex, seems to be doing uh, pretty well. She's got a little bit of head congestion and uh, no fever at all, a little bit of achy stuff, no taste or smell. That's sort of how we knew something was going on at our place. When she walked in, I was cooking dinner, and she's like, Dad, what are you cooking? I can't smell anything. And we kind of snapped and looked at each other and went, uh-oh, that's... That's not a good sign. And so, um, so far, all things are well. We've kind of got her quarantined, and Rita and I and Amelia are having a big honking sleepover in Pops and Mimi's room. Um, and so it's been good there. So a couple weeks ago, we kicked off this series on the fruit of the Spirit. The first week was all about love, right? I used Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. We're using Galatians 5, 22 and 23 as the, the basis, the fruit of the Spirit's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. And then each week, we're kind of adding to that and going, hey, what does love look like? And Paul said, love one another means to regard one another as more important than yourselves in Philippians 2, 3. And I said, hey, what a picture of love, right? When I love you so much that you're more important than me, that's love. And the second week, we looked at joy. And Abby had this awesome illustration with the candle and Mr. Happy and Mr. Joy. And when the heat cranked up to Mr. Happy, he exploded. But Mr. Joy was full of the Holy Spirit. And when the heat cranked up and life came and the pressure built up, the Holy Spirit was able to sustain the joy inside of Mr. Joy, regardless of the circumstances. And what we said was that joy is the positive confidence that I feel from knowing and trusting in God, regardless of the circumstances. 
And I, I acknowledge to you, here's some of my joy blockers, some things that get in the way of Ken feeling joyful, right? Selfishness, bitterness, fear. Those things sort of get in the way. God's going, Ken, I want to produce joy in you, but I'm selfish. I'm, I'm bitter in a relationship. I'm scared about the outcome. And God comes flying along and he flings the door open. He says, hey, Ken, get in. I want to go for a joy ride with you, buddy. But while we do, I want to produce this joy. Here's what I need. I need you to focus on giving and not getting for me. Can you do that while we're riding around? Ken, I need you to focus on healing instead of the hurting that you're personally feeling in the moment. Ken, I need you to focus on my power instead of the circumstances that you're navigating in this very moment. And what I've discovered is a lot of times there's things I can control, some things I can't. But either way, when I will go for that kind of a joy ride with Father God, he is able to produce joy regardless of what's happening. Last week, last week we talked about this idea of peace. Right? That the Holy Spirit is on this peace-producing mission in your life and in my life. And we talked about how this rhythm of experiencing the full measure of peace. Not just some little snippets of it, but if you want the full measure, we said to start with, you have to, to settle that spiritual peace. You have to recognize, right, that you and I have been restored into a relationship with a holy God in our sinful, broken state. God said, through my son, Jesus, I will restore you. And so if you want peace, it starts with spiritual peace. It starts with restoring that relationship with God like Ken did on August 2nd, 1985 when I was sitting at camp and I acknowledged that God sent Jesus to live a perfect life, suffer a brutal death and be raised to live again, to be a bridge back for me to have a personal relationship with God. That's spiritual peace. We said some of us have spiritual peace, but, but we don't have personal peace. We're looking into the mirror. We struggle. If only I could have this. If only it was this way. If only it was that way. If only he would do this or she would do that. If only I could get this grade on a test. And God said, hey, need I remind you that you have been fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God the Father himself. And so it's okay to have personal peace. And some of us were like, hey, I think I'm pretty good. I, I've settled the spiritual peace. I've settled the personal peace. I think I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good, and I got us all. And I said, well, how about, how's that relational peace going? We said, to experience the full measure of this peace-producing mission that God has, we got to settle those relational peace places in our lives. And I, I gave some examples of what that looks like. I said, hey, we got to take the initiative, right? Paul wrote in Romans 12, for as far as it is possible and as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So don't wait. God's not calling them to come create peace with us. He's calling us to go initiate the peace. And then I said, hey, let's empathize with others, right? Let's, let's put right there in the crosshairs of that scope the fears and doubts that we have of this relationship being restored and recognize it's empathy, not sympathy. We're not feeling sorry for them. We're feeling what they feel with them so that God might restore that relationship. We talked about this idea of focusing on the issue and not the person, which gets really hard to do sometimes. Because sometimes the issues create these feelings about the person and then we make this all about them. And God's going, hey, remember the battle's not against flesh and blood. And we talked about flexibility and the incredible blessing that athletes understand of stretching and flexibility, how it enhances performance and prevents injury, and that Father wants to do that in your life and mine, that he's, he's in the stretching and the flexibility business. And as we start to experience peace, he's going to stretch us and make us more flexible along the way. And the last part of that, I said, is focus on restoration and not reconciliation. We reconcile problems, we restore people. And if we want to experience the full measure of peace, those are some ways that we can do that along the way. So today's fruit was one that uh, one of our elders, Kevin, was kind of giving me a hard time. He says, hey, I think you're doing, I mean, you're, you're not having church on site on Sunday. You're doing everything you can, Ken, to get out of preaching this fruit. And it's this fruit of patience, right? It's always interesting. This one's not my, my big thing. I, I struggle with this one probably amongst all of the fruits, to be totally honest with you. But, but when we talk about patience, we don't have a lot in our culture. We live in this microwave culture, right? Think how many meals are cooked in the microwave instead of an oven or a stove or a grill. Right? Think about the, how many diet pills are on the market so that we can lose weight fast. How everybody's looking for that one investment in order to get rich quickly. Peace is just not something that we're very efficient at in our culture. And I don't know, again, for me, it's a space that, that God has been and he continued to work. And this idea of being patient 
Because patience is not, not peace, but patience is not one that I exude on a regular basis without the work of God in me. I love this story I read this week about a young Christian guy who went to an older Christian man and he said, hey, um, would you pray for patience for me? And the older Christian man said, absolutely not a problem. Let's go to the Lord right now. And he says, Father God, would you send this young man tribulation in the morning? Would you send this young man tribulation in the afternoon, Father God? And oh, Father God, would you send this young man? And with that, the young man sort of interrupts. Whoa, 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 sir. Sir, I wasn't asking you to pray for tribulation. I was asking you to pray for patience. And the older man nodded and he said, ah, yes, son. But it's through tribulation that we learn patience. Man, that one's, that one's not always fun to hear, is it? It's through that tribulation that we learn patience. Man, I'm a guy who likes my schedule. I'm a guy who likes my rhythm. I'm a guy who likes things to be in order. And, and this week sort of had some things way out of order and way out of rhythm and things early in the week when I wrote this part of the, the message for the week. It doesn't even touch what the last three days has been like with Mimi and Pops being on full-time duty with a six-year-old. And man, how quickly we just forget what that experience is like. But even in the first half, I was knocked out of rhythm and, and in a little bit of my frustration, Rita might describe this a little differently if you were to ask her, so I'm glad we're not on site today so nobody can run down and say, hey, what did that look like in your house? But in the midst of some of that frustration, Rita just looks up at me and goes, hey, uh, what fruit are you preaching on again this weekend? And I looked at her and said, who invited you to this conversation? Like, you're, you're not preaching this weekend. Well, what is it? That for you, here's your question, that challenges the Holy Spirit in producing the fruit of patience in your life. What is it? Here's your family engagement question. What is it that challenges you, the Holy Spirit of producing the fruit of patience in your journey? Take about 45 seconds. Maybe somebody in your living room would answer that question and I'll come right back. About 10 more seconds. What is it that makes you lose patience the fastest? Right? For some people, it's being in the drive through line at the bank. It starts to take forever and it feels like the person in front of you at the drive through line is negotiating a second mortgage on their house from the drive through For some people... It's the person on the airplane that the minute the plane takes off, reclines the seat all the way back into your lap and stays there the entire flight for what feels like forever. For some, it's watching the same episode of Paw Patrol for the 150,000th time. For some, it's getting behind a really slow foursome that takes forever to play a round of golf. For some, it's the person in front of us at HEB that has 16 items in their cart in the 15 item or less line. Or maybe this is just a list of some of mine that make me lose my patience. Impatience sort of permeates our entire culture, doesn't it? Some people are impatient because their sports team gets off to a bad start for the year. Some people maybe are a little impatient because they're, they're not married yet. Others maybe are a little impatient because they walk into the kitchen and it seems to take a little too long to, to get a cup of coffee. We all know a little bit about impatience, don't we? The thing that's amazing about patience is it crosses all the demographics and all of the socioeconomic lines, right? Rich or poor makes no difference. Red, yellow, black, or white makes no difference along the way. Married, single makes no difference. I read this awesome statement about patience that was so simple and it seems so profound this week. When patience is low, uh-oh. When patience is low, uh-oh. When my patience is low, that's when I tend to, to wound my sweet bride or someone else 
that I love dearly. When patience runs low, that's when we sort of put this pressure on our children that it's about how they perform instead of who they are, whether it's in the classroom, on the sports field, or you name it. When patience run low, runs low, that's when the employer says to the employee, hey, why am I paying you anyway if I'm going to have to do all the work myself? How about this one? When patience runs low, that's when we as followers of Jesus look up into the heavens and say, why God, why am I in this situation again? Impatience, we all, we all deal with it. We all have experienced the high price tag of impatience because we've been wounded by the impatience of someone else. And my guess is we've all wounded someone else with our own impatience. We've seen that damage professionally. We've seen it relationally. And yes, some of us have even seen it spiritually through the flesh of people within the body of Christ. In the New Testament, the word patience is macro sumas. Macro meaning long or large and sumas meaning anger or heat. So in other words, patient people have a long fuse. There's no magic formula. There's no magic pill. There's no magic rhythm like, hey, counting to 10 and hold your breath and, and, and do something that actually creates patience in a natural way. There is no natural answer. But the good news is there is a supernatural way for us to experience patience in our lives. God's word says this, and this is so good, that, that he loves us so much. He can't even stand the thought or stand the idea of the damage that impatience does in people's lives. And so what he said is, I am going to take it upon myself to take impatient people and through my son, Jesus, supernaturally make them into patient people to produce patience in their life. And he does this through the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not through our work. If we could produce it on our own, we would. There is no answers for that. It's only through Father producing it. And so some of us are going, well, okay, Ken, I get it. I'm ready. How do we do that? How does the Holy Spirit create it? And I'm like, hey, be patient. We're going to get there. That's exactly where we're headed along the way. God is going to help us to become patient people. And what we think is he's going to do that by placing us on a beach in a nice, calm, serene sound and life is great and life is all relaxing. But my experience is it doesn't seem to work that way most of the time. My experience is God often puts us in situations where we're actually tempted to be impatient. He puts us in situations that will stretch us exactly what we said last week along the way so that what happens in that stretching is that we learn to depend on him to be the producer to be the one that harvests the ground that has been planted and fertilized and grows. And so how does Father do this? He does it in my life in, in a bunch of ways, but I'm going to give you three of them. He does it in interruptions, number one. The first I is interruptions. God tests our patience by allowing us to be in impatience situations and, and like interruptions. You're, you're, you're sitting down for dinner finally and the doorbell rings. You're finally about to go drop down into that bubble bath that you've done after a long, hard day's work, and the phone rings yet again. Jesus, Jesus dealt with interruptions all the time, didn't he? I love the story in Matthew chapter 19. Jesus is literally sitting there teaching, which he did on a regular basis in chapter 19, verse 13. Let's read this together. Then people brought the little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked them. And Jesus said, hey, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. When he had placed his hands on them, he went on from there. In other words, these kids, they want to come talk to Jesus, and the disciples are like, they're too impatient. Hey, y'all get away. And Jesus says, listen, no, 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 stop being so impatient. Let them come. In fact, if you don't have the kind of faith these little children have, you won't even inherit, inherit the kingdom of God. There are all kinds of examples in the gospel letters, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that show Jesus being interrupted on a regular basis and the incredible grace and patience that he showed in each and every one of those situations when these interruptions occur in our life. I think Father's looking down and going, hey, that's my guy, that's my girl, that's my kiddo right there. Now let's see if they respond like Jesus. Interruptions 
foster and grow patience in our lives. The second one for me is inconveniences. Right? Inconveniences build patience. We sort of live in this, this hate to wait culture, right? Microwave meals, instant coffee. We want instant marital happiness. We want instant spiritual maturity in the church. You name it. We just want everything. Quick, 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 quick. That's the, that's the solution, right? Want to have some fun sometime? Next time you're at an elevator and you got just a few minutes, step back instead of getting on the elevator, sort of get in the far wall and watch how people wait for an elevator to arrive, and some are bouncing up and down all over the place. Others are rocking back and forth on their toes. Some are swayers and they're going left to right. And they're just trying to figure it. I love this one, the guy that keeps pushing the button all the time as if that's going to make the elevator arrive quicker. And we're just an impatient culture. There are these inconveniences in life. There's a really cool story about inconveniences, about two sisters. Luke recorded it in chapter 10. It was about a woman named Mary and a woman named Martha, that were sisters. Some of you may know the story, but they're preparing for a pretty big party. Jesus and his buddies are coming over, and so Martha starts running around the house, decorating the tables and getting the food going and, and picking things up to get, the bre- the, the, to get the place ready for this perfect party with Jesus. And in her opinion, Mary wasn't exactly pulling her weight. And so Martha starts to get a little frustrated in Luke chapter 10. Here it is. We'll start in verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on the way, he came to the village where a woman named Martha opened up her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and she asked, hey, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you're worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. I mean, can't you see Martha? Hey, come on, Mary. I'm doing it all. You're not pulling your weight. I'm the only one working here. And Martha begins to complain, even to Jesus. You ever felt like Martha? You ever felt like you're the only one pulling the weight on the project at at the office? You're the only one pulling the weight in the house. You can't get the kids or your spouse or anybody else to jump in. You're the only one pulling your weight in the school project that some teacher assigned you on teams. You didn't get to pick them, and now you're frustrated along the way. It's, there's these inconveniences that begin to happen in our life, and it's through that that the Holy Spirit is plowing and fertilizing and growing ground in our lives to produce patience. Inconveniences produce patience. Interruptions produce patience. And irritations produce patience. Number three. Man, try this one. You want to know what this looks like? Get on 281 on Monday through Friday between 5 o'clock and 7 and try to go north or south for that matter. And go through the drive through line and get your food in the drive through line and have cold french fries. Boy, that one's always fun, right? Look in the back seat of the car after we get home for a day of doing stuff on a Saturday, and there's all kinds of trash left in the back of my car. Those are just all some of mine. Irritations produce patience. Believe it or not, there's a man named Moses in the Bible. He sort of lost his patience through some of these irritations along the way. He had led the people of Israel out of the wilderness and God had performed miracles through him. They had seen incredible things along the way, but Moses gets irritated because of the complaining and the whining of the people. And this is what God said in Numbers chapter 20. The Lord said to Moses, take the staff, you and your brother and Aaron and gather and assemble the people together. Speak to that rock before their eyes and it will pour out water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community so they and their livestock can drink. And Moses is so frustrated as he gathers the people together. He's tired of all the complaining and all the whining. And instead he takes the staff and he hits the rock. He loses his patience. Ultimately, it cost Moses a chance to actually enter physically into the promised land himself. The people of Israel got to, but but it cost him his impatience cost him. Some of us have a short fuse. My aunt and uncle were going to be here this weekend in sight before they head out of a trip with my mom and dad. And I remember as a young kid doing all kinds of fireworks with my aunt and uncle, with my uncle specifically and my dad. And we were always lighting the fuses and trying to make sure that the fuse wasn't too short, that it was going to blow up too quickly in someone's hand or in someone's face where someone would get hurt. And are there some people in our lives 
that are constantly worried about our short fuse and the damage, the explosion of us blowing up too quickly or that, that really quick boiling point that we get to. I saw one that described it as a microwave temper. And God desires for these irritations to produce patience. The Holy Spirit is in the business of using these interruptions, of using these inconveniences, of using these irritations as soil, as ground to fertilize and grow patience in our lives if we will allow them. And as he does it, what does it begin to look like? How do we know? I want to close and give you three really fast things for me that I've seen. Number one is he teaches me a new way to look. He sort of gives me a, a new lens, how to, how to look, right? Through, through these experiences, I start to look at all those words, interruptions, inconveniences, and irritations all begin with the letter I. They're all so focused on me. Every one of them. I, I can sort of become me-istic if I'm not careful. I like this I thing. My schedule, my agenda, my finances, my feelings. And God says, listen, can I give you a new way to look as I produce patience? I'm going to gently take your head in my hands and I'm going to move it off of you and I'm going to slowly begin to redirect it to me so that you can see how I see, so that I can produce a patience that comes from me through you and it gets to overflow into the lives of people around us. The Holy Spirit will do that if we will let him. And I am so thankful for his patience with me as he is over and over has to keep lifting my head. Scripture actually tells us even for those that aren't followers of Jesus, he's even more patient. See Peter's second letter in chapter three, verse nine. He says, not wanting anyone to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Like he's patient. He is waiting for all of us to put our head off of us and onto him. But don't miss this. And I'm not trying to be the bearer of bad news. While all of that is true and he is patient and he is gentle, he also says there is coming a day when he will come again and his patience runs out and it will be too late to call upon the name of the Lord. And I'm not trying to scare anybody or use fear. I'm just saying to you, hey, let's not test his patience too long. Because he's coming back and it's going to be too late. Maybe today is that day. Maybe today you would say, God, I'm not testing your patience any longer. Move my head off of me to you for the first time so that I can begin to be filled with the Holy Spirit and you can produce that. August 2nd, 1985. I use that date all the time. I was sitting at camp. That was the day he went from here to here and it opened up and I realized I've been testing God's patience for 16 years. And I'm glad that he waited. I'm glad he's waited this long so that all of my children could have their head lifted up to Father. And maybe today would be a day that you would call upon the name of the Lord. If you have not begun a relationship with God, he wants to give us a new lens to look. The second thing he does for Ken is he gives me a, an idea on how to lean. So he teaches me how to look, and then he teaches me how to lean. Where do I go when the pressure builds up and I need some help and I'm going to lean in to somebody because here's the deal. The moment we exchange our life, August 2nd, 1985, I didn't come become forever patient. Man, it's a tug of war. It's a back and forth process. And I started thinking this week and I'm like, look at Peter. Peter's like the poster child for this illustration, right? For inconsistency. One minute, Peter's going, Jesus, I'll die for you. The next minute, Peter's going, hey, I don't even know who you are. Jesus who? Right? One minute, Peter's walking on water. The next minute, he's drowning in a sea of despair. And I thought, yeah, Peter, Peter's the poster child. And then I looked in the mirror. And I thought, man, how, how patient is Father with me, with all my junk, with all my weaknesses, with all my words at times, with all my thoughts at times. He reminded me that he's patient and he continues to do a work in me. And even when I am quick to lose my patience, he takes my lens again and focuses it back to him. And it's a constant give and take. And there's moments where I'm like, Father, I don't even know if I'm gaining any ground. And people around me begin to say, hey, you're, you're slow. You're a turtle when it comes to patience, Ken, but you're, you're gaining ground. And the more I lean into him, the more ground. I gain. The writer of Proverbs in 20 says, a man's steps 
are directed by the Lord. They're directed by him. If we'll lean into him. A couple chapters earlier in Proverbs chapter 14, he says, a patient man has great understanding. Right? In other words, this is a sign of spiritual maturity, whether we know it or not. Hey, are we growing in the Lord? Are we a patient man? A patient man has great understanding, but a quick-tempered man displays folly. Patience is wants to grow. He teaches us how to look to him instead of ourselves. He teaches us how to lean into him instead of pulling away from him along the way. He also teaches us, I think, that I mean, we see, we see this idea of, of needing patience and leaning into Father all through Scripture. Noah waited 120 years for the flood after building a boat. Abraham waited 100 years for a son. The people of Israel waited hundreds and hundreds of years for a Savior that had been promised, this Messiah. He says, I'm going to teach you how to lean. And as I teach you to lean into me, I'm also going to teach you to lean into my patient people. Some people that God puts in your circle that are experiencing the fruit of patience. And they begin to help us see what we can't see in ourselves. Proverbs 22 says, Do not make friends with a hot-tempered man and do not associate one with one who is easily angered or you may learn his ways and get yourself ensnared. Because here's the deal. Impatience is a really contagious disease, you guys. Impatience is a really contagious disease. Disease. Safe to say this is one he's working with me on on a regular basis. And he's been gracious to not only continue to do a work, but to surround me with some people that can help me see it when I'm unable to see it in the moment. He teaches me how to look to him. He teaches me how to lean into him. And then lastly, and we're finished, he teaches us how to laugh. This one might sound a little crazy. But if we stay faithful in the Holy Spirit, I think we're going to learn how to laugh. I think we're going to learn how to experience that joy that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. I read a statement this week that says this. If we are a follower of Christ and we do not laugh regularly, there might be something wrong with our spiritual life in that moment. Some of us just need some good, old-fashioned, outrageous, contagious joy and laughter in our lives. And what happens is we tend to take ourselves too seriously. And in that process, now we're in a tug of war. We take ourselves too seriously and we don't take seriously enough the person and the character and the nature of Father God who desires for us to be a joyful people. And it's this tug of war, back and forth. Do you know the scientists actually proven that when we laugh, our entire muscular system relaxes and our body produces these endorphins. And the Bible's been telling us this for thousands of years. Proverbs 14.30, a relaxed attitude lengthens a man's life. We find joy when we learn how to laugh and enjoy Jesus and enjoy life. Guys, the Holy Spirit desires to produce the fruit of patience. Yes, there's going to be inconveniences. Yes, there's going to be interruptions. Yes, there's going to be irritations. But in those He's going to teach us how to look to him instead of looking to ourselves, how to lean into him and to his patient people instead of leaning into our frustration and our own impatience. And he's going to teach us how to laugh along the way to where we find fun and joy even amidst the frustration. And he wants you and me to discover patience, to grow it, to exude it. Now make no mistake, the minute we log off today, some of you are going to go to brunch. Some of you are going to, kids are going to go outside and want to go play. Some of you have something that's next. Some of you are headed into the kitchen to get lunch. Somebody, some of you are going to figure out what we're watching on TV when we log off the, the Facebook or the YouTube thing that's going here. And can I just tell you, the minute you start it, your patience is going to be tested. Because Satan's just going, hey, they just learned about patience. Let's see how they do. Let's go see how they respond. And are you and I, in that moment, are we going to try to quiet and stuff down the harvest of the Holy Spirit producing this fruit? Or are we going to envelop it and open up our arms and learn how to look and learn how to lean and learn how to laugh as Father God does a powerful work of producing the fruit of patience in your life and in mine. Let's be a people 
defined by patience. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for our time together to worship, to praise. We pray um, for all of us that we would be a people of patience, that no matter where we are on this spectrum, Father, would you teach us how to look and how to lean and how to laugh in such a way that this fruit of patience is harvested in our lives and people around us look up and go, hey, something's different. And we give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor. Father, and all these inconveniences and all these irritations, Father, and all these interruptions in our lives this week, continue to bring this back to our minds so that you can do a work that we could not do on our own. Supernaturally, you will take us from impatient people to patient people. In your precious name we pray, amen. We love you. Our prayer, our plan is to be right back gathered both on site and online next Sunday, August the 8th with the next fruit, love, joy, peace, patience. We're going to put kindness and goodness together next week. So you're going to want to take a look at both of those, but have a fantastic week. Continue to pray for families that are healing and recovering. Thank you for being a body that's been serving and loving so many of them and go ahead and sign up for the meal plan for the Van Pelts and the Myers as well. Love you guys. We'll see you soon. Thanks.